Well, I want to thank uh, Dr. Walker for inviting me to talk on radiation protection, which is a topic which is probably under uh, appreciated in most of the healthcare work environments and something that, you know, is pretty important. I've been an interventionalist for uh, 30 years, and I, I wish I had been much better about radiation protection when I was in my younger years. And you, know, you have a lot of friends that develop problems related to radiation, cancers, and cataracts, and other things. So I want to talk a little bit about out, um, the risk, and then we'll talk a little bit about what you can do to reduce your risk. Uh, just my disclosures are here. I'm a, a founder and CEO of Egg Medical, which makes some uh, new radiation protection equipment. So just a little bit about scatter radiation in the cath lab. Um, uh, the first is, and it's kind of surprising, you may know this already, only 1% of the primary x-ray beam that leaves that uh, tube housing below the patient actually makes it to the detector to make the image that you see on the screen there. 99% of X-ray photons are either absorbed uh, by the patient or they're reflected by the patient. And that reflected X-ray, uh, those reflected X-ray photons uh, are what makes up backscatter radiation. And importantly, about 20% of the radiation that you might get under the table actually comes from that X-ray tube housing, which particularly near the top of the tube housing has uh, what is some significant leak, and the engineering standard for that is relatively low. So that's what makes up the scatter radiation cloud uh, within the room. Um, in terms of dose, uh, we probably have underestimated the dose that particularly high volume operators get. The International Atomic Energy Agency every uh, decade surveys professions for radiation exposure. Interventional physicians have the highest radiation exposure of any profession in the world, almost three times that of their next competitor, which are nuclear power plant workers. And you think about nuclear power plant and all the efforts they make for shielding and monitoring, and then you think about a hospital, which has almost three times that exposure, and how little we do to shield and how but almost nothing we do to monitor in terms of employee dose. So, you know, if you want to find out what happens to 30 years of chronic radiation exposure, what the health effects are, you got to wait 30 years. And it's been 30 years now. A lot of us have been in this profession for over three decades. This is one study, and there are a lot of them published uh, from Circuit Intervention uh, uh, from uh, about four years ago, where they looked at people that worked in cath labs versus people that worked in cardiology, but not in cath labs, in echo labs or other places. So basically the same kind of person. What they found uh, was a, a threefold increase in cancer in people that worked in cath labs, mainly hematologic malignancies, a sixfold increase in cataracts, and that looks like a number that's very solid. It was found in a Canadian study, a Sky study, uh, uh, a, a French study, all of which come up with uh, around six to sevenfold increase in cataracts. Hypertension and vascular injury because of the vascular endothelium is very sensitive to hypertension, or very sensitive to X-ray photons. Uh, as many of you know, um, many of the astronauts that came back from the moon uh, had hypertension, presumably related to the gamma that they got on the moon. Uh, and the left carotid of interventionalists is thicker than the right carotid artery, presumably again related to this radiation exposure, which is more on the left than the right. Skin lesions we all know about. And then there's this whole evolving thing about neurodegenerative disease and the incidence of dementia being higher in people that have been in cath labs for uh, quite a long time. So significant health risks, uh, probably more than any other place in the hospital would you accumulate it over a period of uh, years. There are a number of other things you may be familiar with uh, uh, research on brain tumors. Um, brain tumors are normally uh, equally distributed between the left and right hemispheres, but in interventional physicians, 22 out of 26 reported brain tumors are on the left side. Uh, the cataracts we talked about and cardiovascular disease in a Canadian study uh, 10 millisievert uh, exposure, uh, which is kind of a high volume operator exposure, 17% increase in the risk of cardiovascular disease, and a 40% increase in women who appear to be uh, substantially more sensitive to the effects of radiation than men. The National Research Council in the U.S. Uh, estimated the risk of a uh, radiation-caused cancer or radiation-caused death. Uh, for operators in uh, interventional labs. Uh, for high volume operators, 10 milligray per year uh, on average uh, or more. You can see that the risk of cancer was about 4%, again, more in women than in men, and the risk of mortality uh, was 2%, uh, more in women than in men. And that means that one in 25 high volume operators will acquire a radiation caused cancer. 
and one in 50 high volume operators will die as a result of radiation acquired disease. That's it. Those are enormous numbers and ones that uh, are, are shocking really for any profession uh, in terms of mortality and cancer incidence. So something's got to be, got to be done about that. We, we know also that the type of procedure that's performed um, uh, results in different kinds of uh, scatter radiation. And the ones that are associated with the greatest dose are the ones that involve the abdomen because the abdomen is very radio dense. So aeroiliac procedures uh, where you're close to the x-ray, but also where you're shooting through a lot of very dense tissue, which uh, increases patient dose, but also increases operator and everybody in the room dose uh, as well. So per peripheral procedures are a, a specific risk. Um, and then uh, patient uh, weight. I, I don't know if any of you in the audience uh, uh, still do angiograms or procedures on people that are overweight. I know in parts of the country, people are very thin, but uh, here in Minnesota, uh, we still have a lot of people that are pretty big. This is a, a study from last year in CERC intervention, looking at patient dose and operator radiation dose based on BMI. And what you can see here is that as the, as the patient's BMI goes up, the, both the patient and the operator dose go up. And if you look at people with a BMI over 40 and you compare it to people with a BMI of uh, 25, the patient dose goes up by a little over twofold, but the operator dose goes up by sevenfold. So as patients get bigger, the operator dose goes up disproportionately to the patient dose even. And fairly markedly, if you can take that and then multiply it times the magnification factor for a abdominal or peripheral procedure, you get to some very high numbers for radiation exposure. So what can we do to reduce this uh, dose of radiation that we all receive? Well, the first thing is to reduce the patient dose, of course, because the patient dose goes down, the scatter goes, goes down. And then the second thing is to shield the staff. Um, and we're going to talk about some shielding platforms, standard shielding, shielding platforms, spot shielding, and wearable shielding. So I don't want to dwell on this because you hear this all the time, but good imaging practice reduces both patient dose and operator dose. Don't step on the pedal unless you're doing something. Cut the fluoroscopy rate, uh, frame rate. You know, if you go from a frame rate of 15 to seven and a half or seven and a half to five, it doesn't proportionally go down. You know, if you go from 15 to seven and a half, it reduces the dose by about 35%. Uh, percent. So it's not a one-to-one -one reduction, but it's certainly a significant reduction. The biggest thing you can do, and this is shocking in one sense because it's so simple, is to use the collimators. If you collimate, even to just the size, uh, to the edges of your image, because oftentimes the collimators are, are farther out than your image on the screen, you can reduce the dose substantially, sometimes by 50% by using the collimators appropriately. Um, uh, the next thing is, you know, don't use Cine unless you really need to record the image. And, and even if you do, FluoroSave is often a much better option than Cine. Uh, Cine images are about eight to 10 times the scatter dose of a uh, fluoro image. Uh, FluoroSave is the same. Uh, the steep angle. So steep angles are great. Sometimes you can see stuff that you normally couldn't see, but the reality is when you, when you angulate, you go through a lot more patient and, uh, and the dose goes up a lot. I'll show you that in a subsequent slide. And then finally, uh, raising the table and lowering the panel detector. I, I went to one of Dr. Walker's labs. I was really shocked because the patient is up like about a meter and a half almost off the floor, and the, and the detector is right down on the top. But if you want to reduce the dose, raise that table and lower the detector down onto the, the patient. Um, sorry about that. I got a little uh, behind. There we go. Um, uh, now, finally, we all talk about education and all that stuff. And the reality is that that's been said. If you look at the graph on the lower part of this diagram, you can see the dose area product for uh, patients in uh, 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 studies from um, uh, the time that um, uh, before a, um, for 110 cases or so, uh, for uh, before um, a radiation uh, safety course and after. And what you can see is that after the radiation in safety course, the dose definitely goes down. But as you go out a month or two months or three months afterwards, that training loses effectiveness. So what that means is that even though we all know what to do, uh, oftentimes we don't do it. And so that's where proper shielding and other devices which can save us from ourselves are particularly important. 
So one of the things you can do is you can get a, an x-ray unit that has uh, a lower dose. And, and remember these units, the tube, uh, the tube housing and the detector are pretty much the same as they are in a standard x-ray tube. The reason you can re get reduced x-ray exposure for the patient and for yourself in these systems is because of the software. The software does a lot of uh, image processing, allows you to take a lousier image and make it into a better image. That can reduce the dose by as much as a half uh, compared to standard systems. Um, but remember, those, those systems are also very tunable. So if you want to get a 50% reduction in dose from the from these systems, uh, you have to be willing to accept a little worse image. If you want a little better image, then you're probably going to get a 30% reduction in dose uh, for it. So it's very, very site-specific, and you have to sit with your uh, radiation physicist or the person from uh, the company and tune that unit to where you feel comfortable that you're getting the image that you want at the lowest dose. Well, everybody wears a lead apron. And, you know, lead aprons are great. Everybody thinks that, you know, they're kind of like bulletproof, uh, but they're really not. They leak. They're just filters. So all shielding is a filter. And uh, uh, I think most people wear somewhere between a 0.375 and a 0.5 millimeter lead equivalent lead. 0.375s have a 10% leak. And 0.5 is a 4% leak. That means 10% of the photons in the 0.375 get through the lead and go to you. Uh, if you're at a 0.25, which is like super light lead, and they wear a lot in Japan and other places, almost 20% of the photons uh, get through that. So, you know, they are shielding, but they're not really shielding in the way that you might think that they're shielding. And of course, if you go to 0.7, you get a 1% leak, but, you know, it's very difficult to wear because of the, uh, because of the weight. And these aprons don't last forever. Um, a lot of labs uh, have uh, programs where they look at the lead periodically, uh, but many don't. And uh, the average fractional lead aprons that are examined in these programs, uh, uh, about uh, 4 to 17% have unacceptable defects. These cracks in the lead over 10 month period of time grow by uh, almost uh, 3% or three times. Um, and the average age of a life of a lead apron is eight years. And I've been betting a lot of labs, there's a lot of aprons that are a lot older than eight years. So lead aprons are great, but remember they're just a filter and, uh, and they are prone to defects. Um, the other piece of standard shielding that actually does work are the table skirt and the hanging shield. And I'm gonna emphasize a couple things about, uh, the, the table, about both of these. The table skirt usually comes with an addition that comes above the table. The mattress is a very large emitter of X-ray. And so, um, when you think about mattresses, um, you need to remember, uh, or about ta uh, table skirt shielding, you need to be above the mattress in order to get effective shielding. The stuff below is very important, of course, but above is just as important. And the second thing is, um, there's a lot of uh, scatter radiation that comes off the abdomen, even if you're doing a chest procedure. And that hanging shield needs to be up against the patient. Uh, a lot of these shields now come with flaps that kind of drape over the patient. But if your hanging shield is above the patient, the amount that's coming out in that gap is an enormous amount of x-ray. And you're really not getting anywhere near the protection you think you're getting with that hanging shield. Uh, and so this just uh, emphasizes that uh, a little bit, um, uh, the scatter radiation from the groin, the legs, and the shoulder. And if, unless that uh, shield, if you look at it on the right-hand side where it's really not uh, effectively down onto the patient, you're going to get a lot more, um, you're going to get a lot more uh, x-ray coming right out of that gap right there between the two. Okay, so a lot of people use a rad pad or some other uh, form of what, what I would call pad shielding. Um, now, remember... Um, most of the radiation scatter, uh, almost 70%, is tabletop and below. The rad pad protects above the tabletop. So first of all, its field of protection is relatively small. Um, and it only protects uh, the operator, of course, during these procedures. If you look on the right-hand diagram here, what you can see is that if you have a table skirt, um, um, you've got very low radiation levels from the floor up to about 60 centimeters. So this is uh, where the operator stands up to two meters up, measured every 20 centimeters. So the table skirt's great. Uh, the mattress, uh, you can see with standard shielding or with a rad pad and standard shielding, which is in the black, you can see that there's a, still a substantial amount just below the mattress. And at the mattress, there's an enormous amount that comes off of the uh, patient. The rad pad, um, uh, again, shown in black here, the standard shielding, which is a hanging shield uh, shown in uh, green. Rad pad provides effective shielding and it's really modestly effective shielding. 
uh, only from about uh, your uh, just above your waist uh, up to your shoulders. And once you get above the shoulder, again, it has almost no effect on uh, radiation dose. So, so uh, of course, you wear your badge in the zone where you're getting protected. So your badge levels go down a lot, but, but your head, your waist, and your legs are really not getting eff uh, effectively shielded by, by rad pad. And so that's a problem. The actual dose reduction, when we measure it, is about 13%, but it's certainly below uh, the the sixty six percent that uh, sometimes you see quoted in the literature. Uh, another thing you can use is the barn door. So that's basically a big shield. It's obviously uh, difficult to work around. Most of these are totally clear, uh, and they are very effective, but they're tough to work around. And again, they only shield the one person in the room, which is a little bit of a problem. We all we're all very. Uh, doctor centric and not realizing that our nurses and our techs are also getting a fair amount of dose. So the take home messages from this first part are that shielding effectiveness is measured in lead equivalency, um, that a half millimeter lead has a 4% leak. Lead aprons often develop cracks. The hanging shield is effective in reducing radiation exposure above the waist, but only for the operator, of course. You have to make sure that it's positioned on the patient and not above the patient. The table skirt uh, shield is very effective for below the table where there is a ton of radiation, but the gap at the mattress allows a lot of x-ray through, and so you've got to remember that you need a table skirt that uh, uh, comes up a little bit higher, and again, it only protects the operator. And disposable shields have low lead equivalencies, usually an eighth of a millimeter of lead or, or um, maybe at best a, a quarter. They're expensive and they tend not to protect much. Um, they only protect above the waist, not much below the waist, and the head, they have minimal effects. All right, so there's some new generation uh, systems out, and I just want to talk about a couple of them. One is the zero gravity system, which is used uh, initially in EP and in neuro intervention other places. It's essentially a hanging uh, lead apron that allows you to do your procedure through it. It's got to be draped. The draping is a little bit complicated, uh, uh, but it takes a, the, the beauty of it is you don't have the weight of the lead apron, so you don't have all the ortho effects from that, and, uh, and it's actually pretty effective. It's a little cumbersome to work around. But if you look at the dose reduction, it's uh, quite significant. This is a, a study published from a neurointerventional case. Uh, the lead apron uh, alone is shown in uh, uh, blue in terms of the operator dose. The zero gravity is in uh, green. And you can see that compared to a lead apron at the head level, there's substantial reduction. Uh, at the thyroid level, uh, dramatic. And at the chest uh, level, uh, super dramatic reductions. And at the foot, again, fairly dramatic reductions in, in operator dose. So this is a system that clearly uh, is great for the operator, a little cumbersome to use, requires some draping. But if you want to get effective radiation reduction for the operator, this is a great system. Um, this is another system, the uh, EGNEST uh, radiation protection system. Um, this is a system which is fairly comprehensive and replaces the mattress on the x-ray table. It's a carbon fiber frame that's filled with uh, a foam for the patient. The patient lies on this, but it's got radiation shielding within the system and then a railing system around it that allows you to attach a number of accessories which have uh, 0.5 lead equivalent uh, uh, shielding around the table below the table, above the table, and this provides for protection for everybody uh, in the room. Um, uh, uh, the uh, reduction in the x-ray scatter cloud is quite significant. This is a estimate of total room scatter radiation, so the total volume of scatter radiation uh, within the room uh, from uh, the patient's left shoulder all the way around to the uh, uh, assistant and then including the nurse who's uh, a meter and a half away from the table. What you can see here is the total room scatter with no shielding, with standard shielding, which is the hanging shield and the table skirt, and then with the egg nest addition. And uh, uh, if uh, what we're looking at here is the importance of uh, uh, shielding and angulation. So what you can see is in the PA projection, um, the doses uh, are significant, but they're actually much lower than they are in the angulated projections, which you can see on the right-hand side. Standard shielding has a modest effect on total room scatter, but you know it's not intended to reduce total room scatter. It's really just intended to protect the operator. And so its effect is fairly modest. The EGNIS system shown in green, uh, which is intended to reduce total room scatter, uh, has a significant suppression of uh, the radiation within the entire room. As you angulate that X-ray and you go to... Um, uh, particularly the iliocaudal position, you can see the without shielding, um, the uh, total room scatter is almost four times what it is in the PA projection. And you, and you can imagine that if you take this and then you put it into a 
uh, a 40 BMI patient, you know, that's going to be like 20 times what it is in a PA projection in a uh, in a 25 BMI patient. Now, most interventionalists will say, I thought I thought the LEO cranial was the the biggest. Uh, uh, radiation, uh, scatter radiation generator, and and it is for the operator, but for the room and for everybody else, it's the aerial caudal view because you go through so much abdomen that has a bigger dose. And what you can see here again is that the Agnes suppresses the uh, scatter radiation dose in all of those protections. So so that's a system which protects everybody in the room, not just the operator. Uh, what about lead glasses? Everybody talks about lead glasses, and lead glasses are you know relatively effective. Um, this is a study from. Um, uh, uh, 2014, there's another one from Kevin Federley in, uh, in, at Mayo, which shows basically the same thing. And essentially, and I won't go through this whole diagram, what this shows is that when you're looking at the x-ray, which is position A on the top there, you get very good protection, as you would expect, because the x-ray is coming right up through your glasses. But when you're looking at the monitor, or you're looking away from the monitor, or you're looking down, um, the x-ray... Uh, uh, reduction is, uh, I'm sorry, when you're looking up, the x-ray protection is a lot less because that x-ray is coming up through your skull or through the side of your skull into your eye. So radiation glasses are great when you're looking at the x-ray, but as you look straight ahead or rightward, uh, you can see on the uh, lower left diagram there for the left and the right eye, left eyes in uh, red and the right eyes in, in black, you can see that as you begin to look away from the x-ray from left to right, Right, that the radiation protection goes down quite a bit. And if you look as you as you tilt your head uh, up, uh, neutral, and then up on the right-hand side, as you to, uh, do it up, that the radiation protection becomes relatively almost zero. So glasses are great when you're looking at the x-ray, but if you're not looking at the x-ray, they provide modest protection. Uh, the no-brainer cap is something that I know a lot of people wear. Um, and uh, I, I guess if you think about this, um, you got to remember the radiation dose is coming from below. It's not coming from above. So the no-brainer cap is great for cosmic radiation, but when you're talking about radiation that's coming up through your chin and neck and skull, um, the reality is that the dose might not be as much. So Kevin Federley at Mayo looked at uh, two types of caps, the one on the A cap on the right-hand diagram on the left, A, and the B cap, which has the the shield over the side of the face. And let's look at the effect of that on brain radiation in his uh, great uh, phantom model here. So as you can see on the left is the control image and the radiation uh, is in uh, um, uh, areas are in uh, uh, yellow. The surgical cap, when you sum up the brain radiation dose reduction it results in a 3% reduction in brain radiation. When you add that surgical hood and that flap on the side, however, 55% reduction in overall x-ray dose. That's substantial. So my recommendation is if you want to wear the no-brainer, you need to wear something on the side of your face. And of course, there are other things I think you can wear now you can find uh, uh, commercially that may provide that flap on the side. But you need a batter's helmet, not, not a baseball cap if you want to get that kind of reduction. So radiation exposure is a significant health problem for interventional physicians. Uh, three times the incidence of cancer, six times the incidence of cataracts, more cardiovascular disease. By the way, it's a barrier to entry for younger physicians. A lot of younger physicians, particularly women, don't want to go into interventional um, uh, professions because they know that their lifetime risk is going to be fairly substantial. Uh, scatter radiation doses increase with patient weight, uh, chest and abdominal imaging, um, uh, and with uh, x-ray angulation, uh, particularly with abdominal imaging. They're the highest for um, uh, uh, EVARs and pelvic procedures. Um, the dose near the uh, head and chest uh, can be very high, even with standard uh, shielding. Standard shielding provides limited protection for the angiographer positioned at the radial and femoral access sites, but there's a lot of gaps in that protection. Improper use defeats the effectiveness of the, uh, of the uh, systems. Adoption of uh, dose reduction and newer shielding systems, which I think are now available on the market, can protect both physicians and cath lab staff. And that's really, honestly, where we, that's where we should be going now. We're in a position now where we know what the risk is. Um, newer shielding systems have been developed, and it's time for us to start employing these systems in the work environment. You know, hospitals uh, traditionally have not been great at uh, providing a safe work environment for their employees. Most of the uh, emphasis that we have as uh, healthcare providers uh, is to protect the patient. But the reality is that we we work in 
relatively unhealthy environments from an infectious disease standpoint. We all know this from the COVID stuff, but HIV and Hep C and you know, infectious diseases. Turns out the radiation risk probably for interventionalists is higher than any of those risks. So that's something that we need to take care of and we now have the tools to do it. So uh, thank you very much for your attention. I appreciate the opportunity to, uh, uh, to talk about this subject and uh, hopefully to spur you on to better radiation protection. Thank you.